Hey everybody, welcome to Should I Love with Jason Stewart and my guest, my good friend, Lee Garlington. Hello. And Lee's been on several different incarnations of my show. Yes. And we met, um, this is what I always like to say in the beginning, we met auditioning for a play. It was called Strider. It was well, at, oh, oh. It was Strider. Oh. You remember that? No, I it never remember the, this part. It was at the Cast Theater. You had this long, billowy, kind of woolly hair. And you looked at me and you said, you don't like me. And I said, no, I like you. I just don't like your hair. And that's when we became friends. And you and I have no memory of this whatsoever. Well, was, you scared the shit out of me. And you actually put me in the first play that I ever played a gay person in. And you sort of changed my life. Because it gave me the opportunity and the, and the moment in a play called Panic in Griffith Park to see that I could mix my art and who I was as a person into something. And I never thought that was ever going to happen or I would ever have that opportunity, nor would I have even thought of it. And you held my hand during it, and so did Ian Fraser, God bless him, and David Reed. And you guys all held my hand. And I was frightened, honestly. It was probably one of the most scariest things I'd ever done. That, that it was an life. extraordinary experience, that play. Yeah, it really was. Yeah, very it was special. About, tell people what it was about. Well, it was, You directed it, it. I directed it, and we kind of all took David's script and did a ton of improv to sort of embellish it. And it was... Because it was written so fast, honestly, because of it, what was happening. Okay. Are you was telling it? the story or am I? You are, but I'm just... I was there too. <laughs> well, it was about... It was uh, to, to go against no on the... the Lyndon, LaRouche. Lyndon LaRouche, but I don't remember the name of the bill. It was, no it was on, a number. I no on 84 or whatever the hell it was. And yeah. the people from uh, Cheers put in a lot of money. It was uh, uh, Woody Harrelson and uh, David Lee and I'm trying to think of who else. Because David Reed worked, worked for Cheers, so they put up a lot of the money. And then it was this extraordinary story of five men who get rounded up and put in Griffith Park because they're, you know, they they're gay and they could be, they could have AIDS and they were accused, not even knowing that they had it, yeah. accused of having HIV or AIDS. Yeah, and so I I had the opportunity to work with these amazing young actors. This was what what twenty five years ago, nineteen eighty six, I believe. Wow. So yeah, that was it was a it was intense. It was quite a, it was a journey. I remember how we did our first reading of it. We were all doing the AIDS walk, and we walked. And then we went over to the theater and we sat afterwards and read this script. And you asked me to be in, read it. And I was like, oh, man. I was like, I didn't even know how to say no or yes. I was just so excited at the possibility of that. And then I've watched you and your career. You are somebody that I find, you've had, according to IMDb, you've had 223. It's, it's, it's over 300. I got to go through there sometime and check that. Well, there's a lot of things missing. But over yeah. 300 film and TV shows. Yes, as an actress. Correct. And that's sort of amazing. It's amazing that I've had that many and I'm not famous, especially. Well, <laughs> you are in this town. I mean, you no, are I'm in not. this town. Oh, I'm I think famous. you are. I'm just, I'm, I'm a known entity, but I'm not famous. But I think you are to the business. People know who you are. I, we talk about this all the time. And I think that, I think it's extraordinary. I mean, you've had, I think, four to five series. You've had uh, 11 or 12 recurring or two-part roles. You've worked with some of the greatest people in the business. I mean, the first thing that I saw you in was a play called um, Lukash, uh, Luk Last Summer at Last Summer Cove. Luk Luk Cove. And it, you had replaced, I saw the night that you replaced uh, Jean Smart, who was... No, I was work. Jean's understudy. Right. Oh, and, were, and I had a small role in the play, and then during the 18 months that Jean was in the play, she did like, you know, 14 different series, and every Friday night she'd be shooting something. So in addition to my regular part, I was also her understudy. And that's the night I saw it. And I was so... Um, it was I, an extraordinary role. It's, I just fell in love with it. It's you. funny. It was so cutting edge back in 1982, and now it's like Hallmark card. Yes. <laughs> Well, it was a play about these lesbians. And, it's, uh, and it was a play about cancer. Oh, yeah. And I would always forget to remind people which one. I'd always go, I'd say to, you know, like my mother, now remember, it's lesbians and we kiss. And then I'd forget to tell my friend whose father just died of cancer that it was also about cancer. And I'd be like, oh, my God. Ah. But isn't it funny that this is what sort of was the big thing that I think spurred your career on? 
so many things for you came from this, playing a lesbian in a role, and you're not a lesbian. I mean, it's just so bizarre. Do you know what I mean? Because in people, did anybody ever say to you, hey, don't do this? No. Nobody. Isn't that interesting? And did anybody say that to Jean? No. Well, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. So it's just so, because this was in the 80s. It was. Such a different time. And yes. people looked at it so differently. And we always give a big shout out to Jackie Birch. Yes. Who came and just sort of helped you get an agent. She saw the first play, which was also by the same playwright, Jane Chambers. I did a play called A Late Snow. And Jackie stayed after her and said, I liked your work. Who represents you? And I went, uh, and she Nobody. set me up with um, five agents, none of which I think were, none of whom I think were particularly interested, but I did actually get an agent with one of them for five minutes before I moved on to the agent I've been with now forever. And, uh, but she also got me my first part in a movie. She brought me in and basically made my deal for me. And I did a, a, my first, my first actual film or television role was in Psycho 2, playing me, Myrna the Mean Waitress. I made, I think it was, what was it? I made $1,600 in four days, which was just beyond belief. It was double my annual salary. And I remember I went out and bought myself a pair of purple boots that I still have. I love that. But I got to say, the, thing, the, the movies that really, and I, and I would love to know, the whole process in all of this, the movies that I love the most. What are you looking at? Oh, there's something that you're turning over that she doesn't want to see in, uh -huh. my, in my office. I don't know what it is, but you'll tell me later. I will. Okay, lovely. Um, the movie that really, I think, for me, sort of pushed you over the edge again was probably Field of Dreams. Well, and you only had one, is, did you have one or two scenes in it? How many, I don't even remember. I had one scene. One scene. But you have to understand, Phil Alden Robinson, who, besides Jackie Birch, gets my, my thank you when I receive my uh, Oscar. Um, Phil put me in all of his movies that had white people in them. And so his first one was, when we shot it, it was called The Woo Woo Kid. And oh, I think, yeah. Uh, when we, I think it was called In the Mood, and it was with um, Patrick Dempsey and my, my Angel. Talia Balson. Talia Balsam and Beverly D'Angelo. Oh, I love that. And I had one word. And then I went on to Field of Dreams and I had one scene. And then I went on to his next movie that I did was um, uh, Sneakers. You did a really And then part. Some of All Fears and The Angriest Man in Brooklyn. So I've been in five Phil Alden Robinson movies. I've been very blessed. He calls me his good luck charm. And he's truly one of my favorite people on planet Earth. You know... Field of Dreams came out in 1990, I call it when Kevin Costner had his three hit slam, you know. He had three movies in a row that were big hits. It was uh, um, Field of Dreams. Uh, then uh, We're now doing the, the, the Kevin Costner res retrospective. But, but, but he had three, he had three big, he was like, he was the hottest movie star at the time. He's really cute too. And, he, and he's just, he was just really, really big. And that scene in the movie stood out so much. You had this fight with him at a town hall. No, meeting. I had a fight with Amy Madigan, his wife. Oh, was it Amy Madigan? Okay. Mm -hmm. And but, but he, was he there? Yes. Oh, okay, good. Uh, at least I got that right. <laughs> and, um, but I'm remembering, I just remember you standing up and arguing, and it was so, um, it was so visceral. It's, it was so raw. It was so, you were so terrific in it. And it just made such an impression. It's when everyone went to see a movie when it opened. It was such a different time. And it, I think it really changed your career. Do you think it did? Or? No, I don't. I, I personally don't feel like anything's changed my career. I just think I've been very lucky and very blessed. And I had a little bit of talent. And I, you know, it's funny. I never, um, I don't know that anything has led to anything. I just have been very blessed to work steadily. I booked 10 to 14 jobs, theatrical jobs a year. I never did a commercial. I did nine pilots in 10 years. I thought that was normal. I thought that's what everybody did. I just, um, I didn't get, I, you know, because I wanted to be Meryl Streep, but that position was occupied. Um, but I, so I was in that, you know, ambitious, hungry, the early years of your career where anything less than stardom is failure. I didn't get 
I didn't have the appreciation at the time of like, oh my God, oh, honey. I didn't know that you felt that way. Anything? Oh yeah, I didn't get that I was a working actor and that I made my living and that I had the respect of my peers and I had money in the bank and it took me, you know, it's a, it's a journey. I don't think most people go into show business because they come from happy, well-adjusted families. You know, most people go into show business because they're, you know, hungry for fame and recognition and success and that will validate them and make them important and now people will listen to me and, you know, it fills up those empty holes that we often have. Um, you know, I, I always joked with Neil Patrick Harris who played my son in a movie before um, before he did Doogie Howser and I got to know his parents really well. We were down in Georgia and I I said, you, you people, this family can go to the well-adjusted families of America conference and you'll be the only family there, you know, but it's, that's not the way for a lot of people. There's a lot of wounded people in show business. And so for me, it took a long, it was a long journey to get that, you know, happiness is wanting what you have, not having what you want. And that you can have an incredibly successful life without necessarily having the successful career of your dreams. And at this point in my life, I'm filled with basically nothing but gratitude, you know, because I, I made a great living. I'm not working like I used to because I'm a, a, you know, I'm, a, I'm an actress in her 60s. And that's what happens um, if you're not already famous. And I'm okay, you know, because there's so many other things that have filled me up that I'm not in show business anymore because I have empty holes that need to be filled. Did you have a moment when it changed? Because I know when it changed for me, there were certain jobs that cha changed for me, the idea of wanting to be rich and famous and successful and sought after. But there were certain jobs where the work all of a sudden became, oh my God, this is incredibly fun. Um, I felt that way a number of times. All of Phil's movies were very fulfilling. Um, you know, getting, you know, getting to work with Robert Redford and Morgan Freeman and Ben Affleck and Ben Kingsley and, you know, uh, Mary McDonnell and River Phoenix and all the people who were in Phil's movies was just such an honor. You know, I got, I got just, I refer to Morgan Freeman as my boyfriend, you know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, that, that, that was thrilling, but there were also roles like I did, a Killing in a Small Town with Barbara Hershey, and she actually won the Emmy for it that year. And it was this really intense, hard film to do. Tell people what it's about so they'll know. It's based on a, 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 I think the book was called Evidence of Love, and it was a true story in Texas, small town, very Christian repressed community where I played the woman whose husband had an affair with the Barbara Hershey character. And um, I threat, well, it's, it sounds so simplistic, but I basically, there's a scene where I threaten her with an ax and then she kills me and then she gets off. The jury finds her not guilty. It was one of those, my baby ate my dingo. No, the dingo ate my baby. Well, it was really big in the news. Yeah, yeah. It, like in, in it Australia, like but, but the only people apparently in Australia who thought that woman was innocent were on the jury, and it's sort of the same with this one. Nobody else in the world thought this woman should get off. I had something like my character had 87 axe wounds, and most of her head was gone. Um, but So it was just this very intense, intense work, especially the scene that Barbara and I did, you know, for two or three days in this tiny, tiny laundry room, you know, stuff like that where you just have the, you know, on stage and on film and on TV, I've had roles that have been extraordinary. Like I was often hired as the, you know, comic relief in the film or the one who cries in the sitcom. And I never, I was very lucky in the eighties when I started, which I didn't get pigeonholed into. You can only do TV. You can only do film. You can only do drama. You can only do comedy. I kind of got to do everything. Not huge roles, but some really, really. I, I look at my uh, some of, some of what I've done, and I'm very grateful and proud. You got to work in if these walls could talk. I did. That was a very small little scene. But yeah. still, it was like a really iconic uh, film. At the time, you did the one that uh, Ellen DeGeneres produced, right? I she don't pro remember. She produced the uh, the series with Sharon Stone and a lot of people. Which do you remember? What, what? I was the lesbian bar owner. In which? Who are you with? Uh, 
Chloe Sevigny. Oh, yes, yes. You were and Michelle one. Williams. Was it? it was very funny. I remember this was after Chloe had, had shot Boys Don't Cry, but before the movie had come out. And when I read the script, when we were, and I, because I knew who her boyfriend was, and I said, wow, you have sort of a lot of like, you know, sexual intimacy with a woman. Are, how, are you okay with that? And she went, oh, I've already done this. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah. You also got to work with Marshall Herskovitz and in, in, yes. in Jack the Bear. Yes. And I just, he's terrific. He's great. Yeah. I have to say, by and large, my experience in show business has been, uh, if I've worked with a thousand people, I'm making this number up, there have been 10 assholes. I find that too. Yeah. I find that most people are, lovely. are successful that you work with are... The more successful they are, the more giving they are. Yep. And I think it's when you don't feel like you have yours. And that's something that I've sort of learned by watching you a lot. You've really made such an impression upon me about how you've handled yourself. I always say that you have, I don't care, down. And I know that you do care deeply about things. But you have this thing where you can go in and do your work and not worry about what other people think about it. Well, you. I do have that part down, yeah. How do you do that? Um, because I'm a big believer in lead, follow, or get out of the way, which is I come say to it. Slower, wait, say that again. Lead, follow, or get out of the way. So when I come to a set, I know exactly who my character is and what I want to do. If you're the director and you lead, I will totally follow you because I am a director's actor. If you want me to turn on a dime, I will do it. And even if you have me do something I don't think is right for the character, I'm going to give you exactly what you way. asked for. Yeah. And then I'm going to ask you, once I've been a good girl, would you mind if I give you just, can I do one more take that's slightly different? Nine out of ten times they say yes because I've been a good girl. And then eight out of ten times after they see it, they go, oh, okay. So now, you know, they sort of get exactly. what it is. So that's, that's, you know, that's been my experience. So it's like I come in not expecting direction, grateful if I get it. So tell me what you want me to do or leave me alone. Have you ever gone in and just got, have you ever been offered a part? And this has happened to me a couple times. You're offered something. You don't audition, so you have no process. You just get this part. You go, oh, my God, I have no idea how to play this. I don't get it. No. It's never happened? No. Never? Out of 300 things? I'm, I'm hating you right now so much. Well, I... Never I, once? You never went, oh, God, I don't really get this character? Well, I've, I, if I get offered something, and I, like, it's funny, I've auditioned for, I don't know how many, uh, what, what month is it? May? Yeah. I've, let's just say I've auditioned 20 times this year. I haven't gotten anything I've auditioned for, and I've had two offers. And uh, both the jobs I did, I knew exactly who the character was. So I don't usually get offered something if they don't have, they usually if I'm offered something, they know who I am and what I bring to the party. Well, I have to think about that then because I, there were a couple times I just read the thing and I go, I don't know what this is really, you know. Then I pass. Really? Absolutely. I just go in and I just... pass all the time. Here's another thing I found Ooh. too. If you pass, it's like an aphrodisiac. Once you say, no, I don't want to do it, they have to have you. It's fun. I did that the other day because they wanted me to speak it with an Italian accent. And I thought, and I tried to do it, and I had my friend who's Italian, and I had him say it, and I thought, and I tried, and I thought, oh my God. I, now here's, a, I will say I this say about it. accents. I once auditioned can't for a um, Nip Tuck, and my character was from, she was Romanian, she talked like this, darling. She was this big character. And um, like kind of, like. yeah. yeah. And the, the character's name was whatever my character was, Brigitte. That was the name of the show. And I, I went to my car place, had a guy and I had him say the lines into the thing for the audition. And here's what I learned. I am not good at audition. I mean, at accents, my husband who's like a freaking stage hand is, I don't know why. But I mean, come on, he's a major stage. He's, he's not yeah, like, but he's, he's a got, big wig. But he's, he's got, in charge. He, know, he has accents. I don't know how. My husband does the best <laughs> accents of anybody I've ever heard. Really? Yeah, he's amazing. Oh, an I got a call of him. Yeah, but so what I learned is I went into audition and I went, I can't do this freaking accent. Here's what I learned about doing an accent. I got the part. And the reason, I, I was consistent. My accent was not good, darling, but it was very consistent. I used the same, you know, I did it the same way, and I sold it. Did you have to speak in the, in the language? No. See, I had to. Yeah. 
That's no. it. And they wanted to know if I could play an instrument. So I thought, this is three strikes, you're out. I can't do, I, because I, I always think that. But enough about you, back to me. I know, but I always think <laughs> if, if um, somebody tells you you want to do something and you just, they already like you and to go in there and not do it well. That's Who directed I, Ghostbusters? Right, Reitman. Ivan Reitman. Ivan no, no, Reitman. not Ivan Reitman. Wait, Ivan Reitman? Ivan's the father, right? And then yes. the Is son. He do, did he do? Right. Yes. Okay. So, so I auditioned Harold for Ramis. him. It wasn't Harold Ramis? No, no, it was Reitman. Okay. So I auditioned for him for um, uh, uh, with David Duchovny. I can't remember names. With David Duchovny. Oh, uh, uh, economics or uh, uh, I'll get it for you. Something. In a anyway, I'll get it, it was this film. And it was a little nothing part. And I was actually, this is back in the day when you actually auditioned for people as opposed to, you know, cameras. And um, it was a reporter. And I said to Ivan Reitman at the audition, I said, well, I can do it three completely different ways. And he went, do it. Thank freaking God. Evolution. Thank you. Thank freaking God I had actually thought of three different ways to do it. I wasn't just saying that. So I sat there and I did the really nervous, scared uh, reporter because the world was sort of blowing up behind me. There's a lot of special effects, and he laughed. And then I did the uh, uptight, can't doesn't have any um, saliva in her mouth reporter. And then I did the I'm slightly drunk reporter, and he laughed hysterically at all three of them. I got the part. I get on the set the first time I do it. I start doing the nervous one. He comes up and goes, No, no, don't do it like that. And I went, Oh, okay. So then I started the second one. He came running up, No. He wanted the plain, boring, milk toast reporter, and I did exactly what he wanted. But but I got the part because I was creative and clever. It's when you could get a part in, in the room because you were interesting. We can't do that anymore. I know. It's so really, sad. Yeah, it just really. I miss is. the good old days. You got to work with Nicole. Uh, I mean, I kind of say Hall of right. Center. How to say it? Nicole Hall of Center. Hall of Center. Okay. And in one of my favorite all time films called Lovely and Amazing. And yes. You Jake Gyllenhaal's mom. I did. What was it like working with her? I love Nicole. I think she's fabulous. Have you worked with her? Because I mean, she does a lot of episodic, too. too. No. Okay. I that just. That was my one and only. She was great. That was. Uh, I see her at my yogurt shop sometimes. <laughs> I think. She, I don't know. I just think that movie was such a. It just touched me so deeply. It's about the way we look, and it's about who we are with our family and with our friends. And, and it also has one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my movie is when Catherine Keener's character makes these little chairs out of um, uh, sticks and, and feathers and things. And this is what she wants to do for a living. And I just, it just, I don't know, something about don't that. Don't judge. No, of course not. But it was absolutely, absolutely hysterical. You also got to work with Robin Williams. In yes, one hour twice. What was the other one? The Angriest Man in Brooklyn. Oh, of course. So you got one more uh, scene film and one not a scene. Uh, one hour photo, what was that like? That was it was intense. It was yeah. a uh, director was who was very, you know, uh, having worked with... Um, well, I'm going to close the door. Friends, they're building a building next to Okay. It's I don't, really loud. I think it's coming from that way, but okay. Um, there was um, having worked Pretty much every director I work with is a first-time director. That just seems to be the rule. And they fall into three categories. They're good or they're going to be good. Oh. They are afraid of losing control, so they micromanage everything. They are afraid and they give up control. And basically, either the first AD or the DP is in charge. That's my experience with directors. So this director fell in the category of um, he wanted to micromanage everything. And I was there for 12 hours before I was used. And the first part of the scene was Robin sitting alone of the day, was Robin sitting alone at a counter. It took 12 hours. Oh, my God. Yeah. So it was great. It was, you know, but it was, uh, uh, and I, I love Robin. I, I thought he was an extraordinary human being. I was very, very upset when he left the planet. Yeah, me too. He's a great, um, great artist. Yep. And I actually met him several times over the years in comedy clubs. I was at a yogurt shop and I was standing there getting a yogurt down the block from the improv and he walked in and we just started talking. And I bought him a yogurt and we started walking back to the improv together and had this conversation and he was just so kind. And this guy, the director, has mostly done since then 
has done an incredible amount of music videos and some episodic TV. And I thought that film was just, I mean, it was an exceptional film. You played a waitress in the, in the coffee shop. I did. Mark, uh, I'm not sure how to say that. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, so you're now, you're actually uh, in a series called Broken. You did, a, which I saw, which is a new thing. You saw it? No, I watched a little uh, trailer of it. Oh. You play a shrink. And you also got to be in a movie recently with uh, Chandra Wilson called uh, Xmas Harmony. Oh, Christmas Harmony. Christmas Harmony, yeah. Who's Chandra Wilson? Who told me she was? She's the lead from Grey's Anatomy. Am I wrong? No, she's not in it. Well, it's, I, th I think I'm pretty sure she is. But no, <laughs> she's not. Sally Struthers is in it. Is she it? Yeah. I thought that was, I, I'm, am I completely losing my mind? A little bit, yeah. No, Christmas Harmony was beautiful. You're totally right. I've got it mixed up with my, yes, no. Oh, wait, no, I'm not wrong. I'm Chandra Wilson. Okay, well. She's in it. You didn't even know. No, she wasn't there when I did it, so I didn't know that. No. And it's funny because I had Jason George on the show last week. Oh, so there's some my dear friend. Yeah, I love Jason. I was I, I actually overslept for our interview because we got here. I couldn't believe it. He's so kind, and he got here at eight in the morning, right before union meeting and dropping off his kids at school. <laughs> Leah's like looking at it. yes, yeah, Chandra Wilson is in the movie. There you have it. So you're still working all the time. No, but I work some. Not but, all the time. But not like you. You work. You work like the rest of us. Okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, and I'm fine with that because I'm at that part in life where I get to travel and I'm writing a lot and I'm just enjoying the hell out of life. You wrote a play. I've that written I, several plays. But you wrote a play that you actually have almost finished. I have finished it. And tell us the name of it. I don't know. It's it's called. Well, the working title is Sister Feud, but I don't think that's what it's going to be called. Sister Feud? It's, mm -hmm. That sounds like a reality show. Yeah. On TBS. <laughs> or or uh, uh, Oxygen or something. Um, tell us about it, because I think it's brilliant. Uh, I'd rather not, because it's oh, not it's, copyrighted. or oh, anything. Okay. I haven't done any of that stuff. Well, so. I want to be in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to be in the reading. I want to be in it. I am week. so, so in love with your writing. And I think it's the, the next chapter of you writing and doing your own stuff. I really do. And I, I do too. And that feels really good and satisfying. So I love, I love acting. I've never been unhappy, basically, anytime on a set. You know, I just, having done this movie, Christmas Harmony, out in Colorado, and I got to know Sally Struthers, who I just absolutely adore. She, she did her at your house, didn't she? She did. Tell and me about her. She's wonderful. So it's that thing of like, that's the greatest gift to me right at this point in show business is the people I meet, is, is the having the opportunity to, you know, share stories and, and this journey that we're on, which is, you know, this is a many are called and few are chosen business, and it's very challenging. And we all know about the, the, the lucky few, you know, the 1% the, the of the 10% who make a living. And, um, but it's like, it's the other 90% that I'm really interested in. One of the things I do through my union is I'm very involved. I moderate a ton of panels with working actors and casting directors. And, and I'm on a committee called the Los Angeles SAG After Conservatory Committee. And we put on a summer intensive. At the American Film Institute, which at is AFI. really cool. Yeah. So that's one of the ways I give back and I get to sort of stay involved is, is I bring, I've always seen part of my purpose on life, two purposes. One is I'm a conduit. I bring people together. And the other one is that How I... How do you do that? How do you do that? Let me say the other one before I forget it. And then okay, I'll say it. The other one is that my job is to learn and pass it on. That's one of the big things I do is I've been mentored. I mentor people. Um, but I bring people together because I'm, you know, I have a big personality and people have always liked me and disliked me disproportionate to how well they know me. Mm. But because people like me right away, generally, because I'm affable, is, you know, I've always been good at just bringing groups together. I've had a writer's group that Jason's a part of. We've been together for 30 years. I'm the only person who's still in it from the beginning, but there are people in that group who've been there for 10 and 15 and 20 years, you know, and I, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm a big believer you've got to stay plugged, you know, so I do the orientation stay, plugged in. Yeah. I do the orientation for new members to SAG after. I've been doing it for, you know, 25 years. So I perform, you know, once a month for three hours. I, I haven't, you know, 50 to 100 people who sit there and listen to, you know, along with a committee. I'm not just the only person. And, you know, when I interview people and I read to kids twice a week and... Go back to the, the, the SAG thing where you do, you, you do the orientation. SAG after. SAG after, right. Yes. Where you do, because we merged our unions five or six years ago. Tell us about the orientation and the people that you meet. I think that's fascinating. So you meet all these people who have just joined the union. Well, I it's a three-hour thing. It's their orientation. And we have various staff people come and speak to them, you know, the... Ilian Morden Kitchaven, who's the executive director of the Los the Angeles door. local, comes and says hi. Sometimes Jane Austen comes in. We have people She's from the foundation president. and the Actors Fund, and um, we tell them about all the benefits they get and collective bargaining, which just got a, an arrow shot through the heart of it yesterday by the Supreme Court. Um, what happened? Oh, that's too long to go into oh, basically we, we just you know, got we're screwed. not just talking somebody's listening to us you know that live no but they're oh. listening to us and yeah. they are listening live right now so you'll say something and then you'll say no i don't want to talk about well that. the supreme court yesterday just in it, fact ruth bader ginsburg the notorious rbg just did a she she read out loud her her which you don't usually do from the bench because basically they struck down a collective, uh, an essential part of collective bargaining for unions, for private sector unions. And I can't go into all the details of it because I've only read two articles, so I don't completely understand it, but it's bad for us. It's bad for unions in general. And it was a 5-4 decision, and RB, RBG wrote the, uh, the dissenting voice. So, you know, and that's one of the things I, I feel like our union is so important. I don't think you know, I always say my agent gets me in the door, I book the, my job, and my union gives me my quality of life. So I'm a big believer in unions. Um, you know, my husband's a union guy, so we're a union family. And, but it uh, is, we're, we're being threatened right now. No, we, we've, are, we've been screwed right now. Yeah. It's past threat. I'll, I'll read you the article afterwards. So if everybody look that up and be aware and know that you have to support your unions. It's really, really important to do that in this time. So if you're listening... And you think, hey, why do I have to be in the union? Uh, it's because it takes care of you while you're working, and it gives you a pension, and it gives you health insurance, and it gives you things that you would never be able to get. I know it's important for me. But what I'm also interested in is knowing, so you work with a lot of young actors. You've coached a lot of act, young actors. You have them in the writer actor group. And what is it? what do you think the big misnomers are? Misnomers? Yeah, what do you think the things are that people... Um, think that when they come in, I always think people come in one way and don't and come in because they see what's in front of the camera. They don't see all the other jobs. They just see, I want to be in show business, so that must mean I want to be Julia Roberts in this movie, rather than see all the other jobs and say, hey, I might be really good at costumes. I might be a really good writer. I might be a really good casting director. Maybe I'm not a talented actor. Maybe that's not my thing. And I think a lot of people think that that's what they want to do because that's the only thing they can really see when they're sitting in Oklahoma or they're sitting in Orange County or wherever they are sitting, fantasizing about being and loving show business. You, do you agree or no? Well, I think if you scratch the surface, whether it's, you know, crafty or scripty or the DP or the, uh, you know, the key grip, a lot of people did start out in show business as an actor, wanting to be an actor, and then went into, you know, part of the auxiliary machinations involved in putting on a show. Um, but I, um, but I, I think that's a childhood dream. I think most kids, little kids, want to be an actor. I think so too. Most people outgrow it. We didn't. <laughs> yes, I, I totally agree. I totally feel the same way. And I just know for me that there, I can name the jobs that I had that have made me fall in love over and over and over again with with the work. Do you, want, do you want to do that now? Is that what you're no, saying? No, don't be mean. Look at her. She's so challenging me. This is my <laughs> friend who's giving me a hard time in her interview. Just to let you guys know, in her own interview, which is the second interview I've done. I won't even tell you about the first one that we're not going to air. That's, so she's going to get me. I'm going to get her. And I just adore your work. I, Thank we you. Did, we did a thing in class once in our workshop, the writer-actor workshop, and some a kid had brought in an audition, very green, very new. 
and you just picked up the script and you read with him. And I couldn't take my eyes off of you. And you had basically only read it once before. And I think that you have that. I think some people have that and some people don't. And sometimes it does them well and sometimes it, it doesn't as much. But it's really done you well. And I, I, Thank you. I, there's a couple things I, I just want to talk about. I remember, it's so funny, when I think of you out loud, I think of you, There's a, you played a Sherry's Feldman on the bridge. And you also, oh, yeah, you that also was played fun. Uh, Ruth, and I'm not going to be able to say her name right. Kitanis. In, in The Killing, which yeah. was sort of similar characters. Kitanis. They were both these women that were very powerful, and they had these haircuts. And, they, and you came in, and you both were, this is not going to happen. This is what we're doing. This is the way you do it, and that's it. You know, it's what I call saying every, it's these one breath characters that come in, and they do this thing, and then they come back, and they do the same thing. And I, and I just, when I see you do that, the power of that just comes across on screen and I totally forget that it's you. Oh, cool. I really, really, you know, the killing was a great show. It was, and you were in the, uh, what I, I think the first season or the second season, the, uh, the really best because it, it sort of, I did both. I, well, I did several episodes. I remember flying up to Canada several times. I don't remember how many. Four. Did I do Aaron, four? Okay. Aaron, like, I'll have to help you with this. I am. Yeah. Paid. You also got to work on saving grace with Holly Hunter. Yes. Now tell me the Holly Hunter experience. I mean, I just adore uh, her. I didn't. Um, my character was weeping. It was a crying role, and so that's what I. I don't. I don't. When I, I've done a lot, a lot of crying roles, and so have you ever dried up and never not been able? Has it ever happened when you just couldn't? Uh, one time, and I got saved by Helen Shaver. That was wow. intense. Yeah. What was that? It was. Uh, I don't remember what it was called. It Helen matter. directed it. We were up in Canada. We were on top. Helen is Supergirl. No, Helen Shaver, not Schaefer. Oh, that's another one. Wait, Helen. One of the Helen. Oh, the older one who used yes. to be on a show called United States that I love with Bo Bridges. Okay. It was not not young Helen. The that's older, Shaver. So it's yes, Helen it's Schaefer? Right. Yes. Okay. So Helen was directing it, and it was this thing. It was based on the movie that uh, Sandra Bullock did with the with the computer stuff. Oh, the net. The net. That was it. And they made a series out of it. Beautiful young actress uh, named Brooke. Um, and um, we were on a roof. I remember my mother was there. We were there from like, uh, you know, six in the evening till six in the morning. It was freaking cold. And my character is threatening to jump off a bridge. I mean, jump off the roof. And I have to cry for 12 hours. And things it was going long and and I felt myself drying up and I was like oh god 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 because now you know after 12 hours we're getting to my close-ups and I went up to Helen I said Helen I, I, I you know I've already killed my husband my child my sister everybody's dead you know I can't kill anybody else uh, in my head what can I do and she said don't worry about it and I just, you know, I'm, and I'm panicking because we're getting closer. And I'm like, I got nothing. I got nothing. Uh, I've never used those fake things because I'm a crier. I don't know how to do this. And I went up to Helen. I go, Helen, I'm really anxious. And she goes, Lee, I'm an actor. I won't leave you hanging. And so I'm just in a complete panic at this time, which is like the opposite of what you need when you're trying to cry. Of course. And so literally everything is, and I'm going to cry telling this story. Everything is set. There's, you know, a million billion people on the top of the roof. It's windy. It's cold. It's four in the morning. We're ready to go. And Helen comes up to me and she says, and she take, takes both of my hands and she looks into my eyes and just stands there and looks at me and I start to weep. And now wow. I, I have learned that as a trick when I'm about to do something, I will turn to my actor and say, can you just look me in the eyes and hold my hands? And it's a trigger for me. It's now a Pavlovian thing. So, Do you know where it came from? It's just because she was loving me and you know, she crying. wasn't going to let me down. And she, she had my back. She protected me. I figured that I have a similar thing that I figured out once. I was watching a movie and all of a sudden I just put my hands out. And I went, oh. And I, and I thought, oh my God, there, I have some sort of past thing. Or something. When I put my hands out a certain way, I can start to cry. Isn't that strange? And I don't know where it came from. I still, I think maybe something in a crib or something from mm. a child. Yeah, that's left a, it somewhere. sounded little when you said it. Yeah, that's when I think it just, you know, because yeah. I had a very young parents, and I'm sure my mom just someday went, oh, God, I can't take this. <laughs> you know. 
so this is what I thought was really interestingly weird, is that you played one, two, three different roles on NYPD Blue. Did you know that? Or did you no, even remember? I didn't. Well, yeah, you played Margaret Lutz, Lee Chambers, and Rosie DePaul on NYPD Blue. Unless they're lying. What? No, I, I just, only played one role. With, and I did a couple episodes, but I played a transsexual. Oh, my God. Transgender. Really? Trans, yeah. Well, maybe that's well, I, why. I got involved with uh, James Sicking's character, and he didn't know that I used to be a boy. Oh, and, wow. And then he rejected me because of it. And that was... Uh, it's so funny when I auditioned for that, because I'm very... I got big boobs and, you know, a, kind of an hourglassy figure, and I got a really round face... I'm like the last person I would look at and go, oh, you know, she could play a transsexual. <laughs> and I've done it three times. <laughs> and each time I'm shocked. And I remember when I auditioned for the NYPD Blue role, I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm sitting in the waiting room and there are some women there that I'm like, I oh, yeah. I just, and I remember I sort of backed into the audition room and I said, the person you want is coming next. She is perfect for this. And then when I got cast, I was like, what? Seriously? Well, I think I know why. Because I'm big. I'm tall. No, I think it's, it's it's your height, but it's also because you have a certain masculine energy. I do have a lot of yang energy. Yeah, and that's yeah. what they want. That's what they want, you know. And the, I got my yang down. The other thing that you did, you got to be in American Pie, too. Yes. Which, uh, you've been in some films where the residual checks probably just went crazy. I can imagine. You don't remember? Oh, I see, I, I pray for that. So, because you've <laughs> been in so many that do that, most of my films go nowhere oh. really fast. Uh, so, that's, I mean, that's your, every kid probably recognizes you. I'm, I'm getting. No, you don't get recognized a lot. Um, I on. get people think I look familiar, but they don't know why. Do they do this? No, they come up and go, well, do you go to my gym? Or, wait, is your daughter, did your daughter and my daughter go to school together? Where do I know you from? They know who I am at Costco. <laughs> People at Costco seem to recognize me for, you're an actress, you are on one of my shows. But otherwise, no. I mean, sometimes people will just come up and say, I really love your work or whatever. But most of the time, I just, I, people are looking at me. And they also, because they have such a horrible memory, if somebody acts like they know me, I'm going to act like I know them right back. And hopefully somebody's <laughs> going to say something that tells me how I know them. And I, I once did that. I auditioned for a director and we both were like, going crazy trying to figure out how we knew each other and he gave me the part and we talked some more during the movie and then finally we realized we had no idea who each other was he just saw you saw he, he obviously saw he just you. thought i looked familiar i think what happens is really is this has happened to me a lot i think it's from stand-up comedy a lot is that somebody looks at you and they act like they know you so you look back and you mirror what they do and then you just assume they know you I've had, I, 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 I actually don't make that assumption, though, because most of the time they don't. Well, I now am in this weird land, and I just try to act as nice as possible oh, yeah. to get into trouble. It, well, show business is a business. It's not who you know. It's who you know that likes you. So this is a be nice to everyone town. How do you do that? Act as if. Fake it till you make it. And you're, you've been married how many years? We'll be 27 this year, a couple months. To this incredible man. To my wonderful, beautiful hubby. And you guys have been taking trips everywhere. Everywhere. And you, you, have, you have a new obsession with your taking pictures of doorways and doors. No, that was just in Venice. And i got to tell you something about this. So there is another person that does this. Who? Uh, Daphne Maxwell-Reed does oh, this also. I just do Venice. <laughs> And if people want to find you, where can they find you? They can go to LeeGarlington.com or is it Lee Garlington, uh, the actress? Lee Garlington, the actress.com because Lee Garlington was taken by a woman with white hair sitting with her husband in a, on a swing and that's their entire website. It was like, are you serious? <laughs> are you serious? So I had to become Lee Garlington, the actress. Well, I got to say thank you so much for being Dot on the com. show. You that's scared. it? You're done with me? Yeah, you scared me. But that wasn't even an hour. Well, it's 44 minutes. Oh, I, is that it? it? It's about what I do these <laughs> days. So apparently, I have I, we have towels all over my table. She's told me how to do everything here. I made mistakes on saying words wrong and shows I messed up. She never went along with it and acted. You know, she never goes. And I was way nicer this time than I was the first time. No, you were nice. You told a lot of stories. Oh, okay, good. You didn't like those stories, but you told them. <laughs> but um. <laughs> I adore you. We're going to lunch now. And uh, 
And I adore you. And if and anybody wants to get a hold of her, just go to Lee Garlington, the actress.com. If you forget, just go to jasonstewart.com, S T U A R T, and contact me, and I will connect you up with her. Thank you guys very much. Until next time, take care.